Yeah, very gay. Yeah, very gay. Yeah, very gay. Yeah, very gay. <laughs> I see my cucumbers. Yeah. <laughs> always go back to the farm, man. Right? The county farm, exactly. man. We spent like five hours there wow. yesterday. Did they put you to work? Uh, yeah, we peeled some rakyo. Oh, nice. <laughs> the history of Japanese food in America. And the history of me. Oh. <laughs> That's a good thing you showed up then. <laughs> and maybe there's Thai curry. Japanese curry is really different, and there's a reason. Japanese kind of stole curry, not from India, but from the British, who stole it from India. <laughs> and, uh, and then the British sailors who came to Japan, you know, they, they had this curry that, had, that was kind of thick, and it, it would be thick so that it wouldn't spill when they were on the ocean. And so the Japanese took that. But everything that the Japanese uh, appropriated, they would adapt and make it Japanese, make it fit Japanese palates and uh, traditions and also local ingredients, right? So I think, you know, you won't find curry in other cultures made with beef, certainly not in India, uh, and potatoes and carrots and onions, the way Japanese curry always, always has those ingredients. It's like the rule, it's a law. Um, and that there's so much that Japanese have taken from other cultures but made their own. And that's, I love researching all of that. I love researching the fact that um, Salmon and tuna, which we think of as the primary, the, our favorite flavors, favorite types of sushi and sashimi. Well, even into the 60s, tuna was considered junk fish. There was sport fishing of tuna, and when they caught those, you know, 100 pound, 150 pound tuna, uh, all over the world, they were just either tossed into the trash or sent to pet food manufacturers, or if it was off the coast of the U.S., would be sent to a cannery to be made into, you know, uh, chicken of the sea tuna, you know, Charlie the Tuna <laughs> TV commercials. So it was meant for pet food or canned tuna. And uh, it wasn't until much later that tuna became this really valuable fish that would be auctioned off uh, and, uh, and sold for enormous prices. Salmon was not popular uh, because in Japan, salmon had parasites. Salmon fished off in the Pacific, and you know, my mom is from Hokkaido. In the easternmost tip of Hokkaido, it's called a town called Nemuro. She loves seafood. She boasts about the salmon, the shake, uh, 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 from Nemuro, and the hanasaki kani, this kind of of crab that's just amazing in Nemuro and the hotate or the you know the um, uh, all the different kinds of, of seafood scallops hotate and um, but she uh, Japanese always ate salmon but they always cooked salmon salmon was not a fish you ate raw because of the parasites but in the 1990s the country of Norway the government of Norway had a surplus of salmon that were farm-raised in the Atlantic. And they realized, you know, I bet we could get Japanese people to eat this stuff raw because there's no parasites. And they created a, a, a position for a man that they sent to live in Japan and, and push Norwegian farm-raised salmon to the Japanese. And it took them until the early 90s to convince a grocery chain to buy trays of raw salmon cut into sashimi. And the only, he gave it to them practically for, for free. He discounted it so much. And the only catch was that the store, the, the chain had to sell it as raw fish. And then a, a famous sushi chef in, in Tokyo picked up on it and tried it, and all of a sudden, salmon became the in thing. Since then, because of flash freezing and technology and 
and uh, uh, global shipping and transportation, uh, it's become okay to catch salmon in the Pacific and flash fry, uh, fr fresh fry, flash freeze it uh, to kill the parasites. And so now you can get salmon that's from the Pacific. So, uh, so yeah, there's, uh, there's so many cool stories about how Japanese food became popular in Japan. And the story of ramen is a whole other story that's really fun to, to get into because ramen is a thing now, but it wasn't. It was just cheap college student food for the longest time. So, uh, Mike, you want to come up here and we can have a conversation? We can take some questions from you all? I'd love to. Aaron and Gil have been uh, sampling the wares around the bay. You guys also did some farm work, right? Yes. Yeah. We well, we ate the farm. You ate the farm. Work. Work. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work for food. It's always a good yeah, That's for about it. If you've never been to Hikari Farms in Watsonville, they it's an organic farm, and they grow all this wonderful Japanese produce and random stuff like they have apple orchards and grapes and wonderful place. And we spent most of yesterday there. Eight. <laughs> Eight, 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 eight. Hikari. H I K A R I. Hikari Farm. In fact, they do pop ups in Japan Town, don't they, Pam? Yes. Right over at DK Traditions. So watch for them. It's a wonderful opportunity. Again, small farmers in California have long been leading the way on a lot of these issues, like organic farming and other concerns that are just now coming in vogue. Just like Japanese food, you know, Gil's talking about that, and it's recently become, there's there are waves of popularity, uh, as Gil's book talks about, and even as he writes them, there are new waves that are coming through. But I'll tell you what, Japanese food has been very, very popular for a long time in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're awake. They're awake. Uh, along with Chinese food. Too. Uh, along with Chinese food too. <laughs> All right. So let's get to some of these questions. You've been very generous. I haven't screened any of those, so I don't know what kind of language these folks are using. Yeah. Okay. This doesn't we're, look like a cussing every crowd. Every time we're at UI call, you never know. I, I cuss them. <laughs> So I might cuss in the you answer. Give a pass. You're giving a pass. All right. We'll start off with that. If you wrote your names down, I hope it's okay. I read the names out as well. Uh, this one comes from Rosie. And her first question is actually a technical food question. Now, Gil's here talking about traditions and origins, but you've got so much knowledge we'll ask you. And if, if we need to go to Google to prevent anyone from getting sick on any of these questions, we'll do that. <laughs> You're not being held responsible. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and the reason I say that is because the first question is a very practical one about storing leftover sushi and asking about microwaving it the next day and we've got stories about that. I don't know if you've got right. technical knowledge, but stories I'm sure you've got. Who, who asked that question? Rosie did. Raise your hand, Rosie. That, that's got to be a joke question. <laughs> oh no. Hello? She's asking for a friend. Su okay. <laughs> sushi is not to be microwaved. <laughs> I can't can you think of a sushi that needs to be heated? Well, if it, no, not yeah. heated. Just the rice, right? Oh, you mean to soften it? Yeah. yeah. Sushi does. See, I don't. We. I don't believe. I. I wouldn't eat sushi that I. If if I don't eat it like right away, I don't want to put it in the fridge because the rice does get boro boro. It gets hard and cold and. And I, I, you're the taste tester. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, in our house, Aaron will hand something to me and say, Can, "Is this still good? Can you taste this? Can you smell it?" Uh, I'm the one that takes. If I don't fall over, you wait a couple hours. It's, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's okay to eat. Uh, what did we eat just now? That was like ten years out of date. Coffee was a ten coffee. years. You know, it's just best if used by. It doesn't say inedible. After that's all, true. Right? So, yeah. That's true. But um, yeah. So somebody really calling me? <laughs> Maybe it's a question. No. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then, then Rosie also wants to know what kind of tuna is best, or maybe your favorite. Either way. Uh, I am kind of a fan of maguro, even though tuna is n not really cool because of all the mercury that can be in it. Mm. <laughs> uh, and of the tuna, I like I like the, the what is it, aka something. It's a basic tuna because it's not so super expensive. <laughs> um, the toro or otoro, which are the fattier tunas, um, they're okay, but I don't, I have this internal balance of cost versus, you know, pleasure. <laughs> and I get a lot of pleasure out of just plain old, you know, red tuna. Uh, the one thing I, there is, uh, there's a lot of like the supermarket tuna 
it's not really tuna. It's uh, it's flounder. It's not cod. I think it's flounder. That's dyed red. So yeah. Yes, so, outrage. I know. Right? Phony tuna. So I um, I don't think I mentioned that in the book, but I just read something like a few months ago about how there's this rash of of fake tuna being sold, especially in supermarket tuna that is um, just dying. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so some of the, the supermarket tuna is kind of a pinkish red and looks kind of eh. And, and you smell it, it's not very fishy, so you think, oh, it must be okay. But it's probably not real tuna. That's part of it. That's interesting. All right. Sounds like another. This, this next book then will be like a, a mystery novel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tuna or not. Who killed Gil? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Gil the fish detective. Yeah. That's a good one. All right. All right. Uh, we have one from Robin. Uh, actually, I think it's from a, a whole a group of folks over there. Uh, first of all, then, this is a short but very broad question, perhaps. What is the history of Odin? Since you talked about the wonderful smells. Ooh, that's a really interesting yeah. uh, question because I don't know the history of Odin. I, it's a winter stew that's popular. In, and how many people in here are not familiar with Odin? One, couple people. It's, it's a winter stew and it can have uh, a dashi base, which is kind of the basic broth that you get in almost every kind of Japanese food. But then the ingredients uh, are various kinds of fish, could be salmon, could be, there could be meat, proteins like chicken. I don't think I've ever had oden with like beef or pork. But it also has chunks of daikon, right, the, the uh, radish and uh, very, uh, satoimo, which is like a potato, small potato, <laughs> it's kind of slimy, so you may not like it. <laughs> um, and it, it, it's, it's pungent, but it's a winter stew, and you, in the past you would often see it in street food, like street carts. Uh, now, if you go to Tokyo or any place in Japan, you can often find oden being sold in convenience stores, which are called konbini mm -hmm. in Japan. <laughs> and 7-Eleven yeah. and is probably the best of them. And 7-Eleven, by the way, is Japanese owned, yeah. right? So it, in the, like the 1980s, a Japanese company bought, I think 7i Holdings bought the 7-Eleven chain. And then they, it's now the biggest convenience store chain in, the, in Japan. And I wish they would, the stores in the U.S. would carry some of the same things that they have in Japan, like nigiri rice balls. But anyway, oh, they, a lot of convenience stores sell oden at the counter, and they have them in the little kind of the metal, you know, containers that you see in lots of restaurants. Like you go to a taco place and you, know, you want avocado, you want this. And they have all the things like egg is another ingredient and you just point or choose the ingredients that you want and you can build your own oden and it's uh, it's delicious it can be pungent which is what i used to think when my friends would come over when i was in high school but it's really good and it's very um i don't know it's, it evokes japan for me so yeah i don't know the history of it i don't know where it started my guess is it's a rural country tradition. A lot of my older generation talk about it as, they say, I know it's farmer food, but I love it. You know, it's, a, it's an emotional connection. Uh, farmer so food. They call it farmer food, so that's cool. A great question also in this list was, uh, you talk about simple or cheaper farmer folk food. What did the samurai eat? What type of that class? Shogun ate? Do we know about Man, you guys are asking some great. Like, complicated history questions. And I know this stretches way beyond what your book is. Well, I think the samurai, they were taken care of because they were so important, right, to the, the daimyo, the, the lords of the various fiefdoms that uh, Japan was carved into, especially during the, that period of history. And the, the warriors, the samurai warriors, were fed better than like the peasants. So 
Uh, yes, the Japanese were. What is that? Do you know the answer? Oh yeah. Hey, okay. right. <laughs> Gil will now read from another work. <laughs> it's called Guguru. Guguru. <laughs> Especially, natural diet was a very important aspect of samurai's life. This was written by a Japanese guy. E eating healthy was necessary to maintain their body to fight well on the battlefields. This is true. Their diet consisted mainly of brown rice, brown rice, brown rice. miso soup. Hipsters. They must have had like <laughs> diabetes. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> miso soup, fish, and fresh vegetables. Rice still is a staple food in Japan. Okay, that's that's true enough. Oh, this is a Japanese website, um, but the samurai were treated to stuff that the typical peasant Japanese would not. So Japanese farmers who grew rice actually didn't eat a lot of rice. Rice was used as a currency, and or they would pay for their lease for of their land to their lords in rice, and so the samurai would get to eat rice, or the samurai would get to eat like. Uh, one of the few meats that was allowed in certain parts of Japan, pork or chicken, uh, during the, the Buddhist era of the samurai years. And uh, they were, it was so important to keep them healthy that, uh, and in fighting shape, right? So they, they were, they were afforded the luxury of eating things that normal people were not allowed to eat. One of the stories, and I had mentioned uh, earlier, eating raw horse meat. Uh, horse meat in Japan is called basashi, and it, it is, it sounds horrible and cruel, and, you know, people around the world will eat all sorts of things. In Japan, horse meat was started uh, as a food because uh, there was one castle in uh, Kyushu, that, or one lord, who was under attack for months, and the samurai needed to keep fighting, and they started, they, the only meat protein that they had left was the horses. So one by one, the horses were slaughtered, and they would eat horse meat to keep the samurai in fighting shape. And that's where the tradition of eating horse meat, or basahi, came uh, into being. And, and we were in Kumamoto a few years ago. And Kumamoto, you know, outside of Kumamoto, we had, um, I had, I think I was the only one in the family that was willing to eat, to try it. But I, I had raw horse meat, I had um, uh, grilled horse meat, I had ramen with horse meat on top. Uh, and, you know, I, I can honestly say, it did not taste like chicken. <laughs> it, it tasted like elk or deer. It wasn't. It wasn't quite steak, but it wasn't. It was. It wasn't bad. And and I can see where if you had to eat it, if that was all that was left, it, it it's there. So it's not real popular, but it's still there. Japanese will eat it. I was going. To, I was interested until you used the phrase "if you had to eat it." <laughs> what okazu is. Uh, Can it be anything with gohan? Cabbage and weenies will show you. What, what is your take? This is just... Okay. This is interesting because yeah. Japanese-American families have a one way of thinking what okazu means. What is to you? Meat and vegetables. Meat and vegetables. Meat and vegetables. Like, like a stir-fry. Stir stir right? Fry. To my mom, and I was talking to her about okazu, and she, she kind of... Of course, she, she's been wrong on a few things. <laughs> but, but my mom said... <laughs> yeah, don't tell her. The Gil didn't say this. <laughs> my mom said that okazu just means side dish. Mm, yeah. Period. You know, so any side dish can be called okazu. But that would mean skemono or, you know, um, almost anything except for the kohan and the uh, soup, miso shiru or something, and the rice, and the, and the, and the main dish. But uh, the side dishes. But okazu, I mean, any stir fry. We made um, uh, kabocha with ground turkey last week, and that's that's okazu. Your mom called it okazu. 
And then we also made, um, just a few days before that, we made something else that qualified as Okazu. All right, so it's, it's, it's consistent what we're hearing. I've done a little hunting too, and especially during Asian Pacific Month, I try, to, yeah. I try to post a lot on Facebook because it's a time when we can start what I call conversations. I, so I, have, I, I, I see how you guys are. Like, I'm gonna have to steal that. All right, all right, well, I have a hashtag out there. So we, have, we talk about these things, and Okazu was something that I didn't comment on because it was so varied. Yeah. Uh, what Aaron's talking about, what your mom's talking about, the same thing as the stories that I've heard all along. Yeah. And what I came to for my own self, just settled in my own head, I felt like, well, it kind of means for those who came through the camps and we're through hard times, it's kind of whatever we got. So yeah. it's the side yeah. dishes. And we put it in there, we just, we, yeah, sha, 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 sha. And then that's dinner, guys. Enjoy it, your rice. It's got to got that. It is exactly it. All right, we have from Grace and family. Oh, Grace Chu, family friend from Japan. Grace, you here? There we go. Uh, what is your favorite Japanese food from Japan? My what favorite you go there, Japanese you food get from this. Japan? Yeah. Um, I love a lot of ramen that I've had in the States. Oh, this tag might, might shape your opinion. Your favorite food from Japanese food from Japan. And did you and your sibling learn from your mother's family recipes? So I don't know if that oh. shapes your thoughts. Uh, you know, my mom, my mom is in the memory care center now, so she stopped cooking more than a decade ago and I'm of my brothers and me I'm the only one that really paid attention to the idea of cooking mm. like when I went off to college she got me a little rice cooker three cup rice cooker and um, and I paid attention to how she chopped vegetables and things uh, I loved chawamushi and very few restaurants at least in Denver serve kawamushi which is an egg custard with bits of chicken and shrimp and uh, you know uh, vegetables carrots and uh, uh, fish cake and they're served in this special cup I have my mom's set of making for making kawamushi and we've it's, we've actually not made it yet. I told Pam we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it, okay, we're gonna do it. Uh, so, kawamushi is one thing that I would say that I miss having because I'm growing up, my mom would make it every once in a while and it was very special and I have her set of kawamushi cups and the lids that go on top and yeah, I love that. It's a special, it's a, it's kind of a ceremony, you know? Yeah. So that's, I think that's what goes along with a lot of the food and the memories. Take the lid yeah. off. Oh, what a treasure, right? Yeah. Dig down, oh, what's oh, that down there? <laughs> it's, right now. it's exactly it's, it. It's a savory, hot egg custard. Mm. It's not a dessert. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's a, it's a side dish, really, but it's really, it's just special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a great, great story, great memory for yeah. you. Um, I, I think we're out of time for the questions, but we do have more, of course. We have book signing, the purchases, of course, a lot of options. Yeah. And Gil will be here. I'll be here. Gil, your stories really ring true for me. I really appreciate that, how you bring people in. You find a way to bring them in. And also for those of us who are in, you help <laughs> us understand where we are, why, or why what we remember might be the same or different than somebody else in our with our shared background. Um, our minister's uh, daughter, uh, started grade school now. Our minister at Mount View Temple came from Japan. Uh, he's got a family temple, but he's the second son. So he came to America to find the temple that he would, because his older brother got the one at home. Yeah, of course. It's a tradition. Not resentful. Very good guy. Yeah. But his daughter came when she was five. So she's come up into Mountain View schools, and she went to school one day as they're all sitting at the table. And somebody, she opens up her lunch, as you talked about too. She opens up her lunch. There's a difference right now. Kids are growing because of books like yours and because of shared information like we're all doing here in yeah. Japantown, right? We're sharing the culture, uh, traditions, and preserving the history and carrying it forward. Be proud of what you are, be proud of where you came from, and take us to the next step. What Kurumi did at that point was she opens up her lunchbox and there's a spam musubi in there. Which oh is pretty, I right. consider that American food right, right here on my shirt. Uh, and her friends turn to her, her dad says, and they go, ooh, what's that? <laughs> Instead of covering it up and being shy and not taking it to school ever again, give me peanut butter and jelly whether I like yeah, it or right. not, she decided, she turns to them and she goes, you've never had Spam Musubi? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> You should try it. <laughs> then she ate it all. Yeah. <laughs>
I, I thought you were gonna say no, she added in I the little the pizza. I think next time she brought more. I yeah. think it's like get a little teaser, right? That's so, awesome. Books like this, Gil, and what you're doing, what you have been doing with your column, check them out on UK View, um, and just support works like Gil's. Uh, small authors, of course, at small bookstores, but also just you the staff. Of, short. No, I just didn't say nothing about that, because <laughs> you have to see my staff that I work with. There we go, all right. <laughs> we, are, we are powerful, powerful uh, at, at, at locations like this. It continues to carry the tradition forward. There's a reason why we need to have this continue, right? There's a reason why we have the stories we have. Don't let them stop here, let them go forward. Let them have a meaning. The food has a meaning, not just for what it means for your nutrition, but what it means for where you came from and where we can go. People are continuing to adapt this, right? Adapt, assimilate, but then move forward with what you got now. So what we have now in America, food-wise, is a whole new direction, different from Japan, respecting what came from Japan, right? That's the important part. Exactly that. Respect for the past and moving toward the future. So please give Gil Asakawa a big round of applause. Give Mike and Owen a big hand. Pleasure to meet you, man. Those of you who do or don't know, Pam, of course, is here on behalf of herself. Nikkei Traditions. Uh, Nikkei Traditions is just downtown. Why the hoop there? So many more things. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Pam Yoshida. Okay. Um, so um, I, I just want to say thank you to everybody for attending. You know, um, I am Pam Yoshida, co-owner of Nikkei Traditions of San Jose, Japan, of San Jose, Japan Town. And Gil's book, Tabema Sho, and Being Japanese American, both resonates with the theme of Nikkei Traditions, which is embracing contemporary Japanese American and Asian American arts and crafts. And we began Nikkei Traditions um, over 20 year, 21 years ago. And during that time, we've sold over 600 copies of Being Japanese American. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so Tabu Masho was released the end of August. So it was just a few months ago. And we wanted to bring as many people as we could to meet Gil and help kick off the birth of his latest book. And we've actually done about three different book events with Gil um, over the years, uh, being JA and, um, and now Tab and Mashal. So thank you, Gil, um, for traveling you. from Colorado to share your time, passion, knowledge, and love of Japanese culture with us. So thank you, Gil. And we thank UI Kai and the Sansei Lecture Series uh, for creating the space and um, planning a memorable afternoon for us to share our food history. And many thanks to our MC, Mike Inoue, uh, for organizing these discussions of how important food is to, under is to understanding ourselves, too. So thank you, Mike. And we thank all of you for spending uh, your time this afternoon to support UI Kai um, with this event. We are donating $5 per book that's sold at the event to UI Kai. And um, let's see. And by the way, we're going to be at JCCCNC in San Francisco tomorrow, same time, one to three. Uh, in case you didn't get enough of Gil this afternoon, <laughs> <laughs> or if you have other questions, so we'll be sure, there. Sure, glutton for tomorrow. punishment. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know uh, if anyone else from UI Kai wants to, um, you know, introduce the next part of the program. But um, Mike mentioned that we were at uh, Hikari Farms yesterday, and we brought back some turmeric and ginger. <laughs> and it's on the tables in back and it's kind of in the center that's for you to you know pick off a little piece if you'd like to take home and we and you know we can tell you about how it's grown please do not eat it raw and pop it in your mouth okay <laughs> <laughs> so be really careful you know you, you can look at it pick off pieces take it home but it's um, not meant to be eaten raw, so. as I told Gil when we saw those boxes from the farm how JA is that? Right? Yeah. Here, and don't just take a few home, take a whole case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'll stay on the thank yous, um, but thank you, Pam and Nikkei Traditions, you know, for bringing and sponsoring all of this and then donating the extra proceeds for the sale of the book. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for being our MC today, a oh. little parting gift. Oh. And thanks for always being a strong supporter of UI Kai. Oh, always. And also, thank Gil, you. Thank, so you, thank you uh, for sharing your time with us. Thank and you. I signed this for UI Kai. Okay, oh. terrific. You have a library. Yes, we do. Oh, I know and you do. I've been here before. Oh, I was were you here? here? I was here about 
five years ago, four years ago, with the AARP, oh. when we gave an Asian American Hero Award to uh, Julie. Julie? Oh, Julie Hubbard? Yeah, Julie Oh, Hubbard. okay. So, um, yeah, my the vice president of AARP and our Asian American crew, I was a consultant at the time we came here and had a ceremony in this very room. Ooh, <laughs> brings back good memories. Yeah, though. yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you again for spending time. I know I learned a lot. Uh, it's not a cookbook for the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> not a cookbook. No recipes. Yeah. I'm so sorry. So that's our formal program. And now the fun informal program begins. Um, we have more books for sale. And they will be autographed for you. Uh, also, we've got refreshments in the back and foods and beverages. Also, mingle, have some fun, meet some new people. Hopefully, you'll see them all again at our next event. And on behalf of the UIKI Lecture Series, we want to thank you all for attending, being a great audience, asking very insightful questions. So, thank you again for coming. Because <laughs> you waited for it. Hope it's good. Between 2004 until we sold out of the book, we sold about 600 copies. No, a lot of older didn't talk about the Yeah. They'd rather move on, you know. Right. Thank you so much. That's for my husband and this one's for my friend. Thank you. Very interesting. Oh, thank you. Of course. Gil, this is my dad, Mel. Hi, Mel. Nice to meet you. I'm his hired entourage. Yeah, right. I hope he pays you well. He does. And I even have to buy my own book. He buys his book. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Is it really a birthday? No. Birthday? Oh. <laughs> My birthday's in November.